Osteoarthritis, Current Conservative Therapy Approaches by Professor Karsten Dreinhofer. Professor Karsten Dreinhofer is an accomplished colleague. He is the head physician of orthopedics and trauma surgery in Berlin, respectively in Potsdam, in the medical park in the Humboldt Mühle, and he is an outstanding expert on back pain and arthritic diseases, as well as being active in several medical associations. He looks after his patients as well as the successful continuity of his department. I am pleased to welcome and give the floor to Professor Karsten Dreinhofer. Let me tell you in advance, even if the time is short, we will answer all questions, even after the time is up. Please proceed, Professor. Thank you very much, Mr. Schuerman. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, without being able to look you in the eye nevertheless, I'm glad you are here, and I wish you a pleasant afternoon. I would like to now show you a few slides and share a few ideas about how to treat osteoarthritis and where the treatment approaches are likely to go in the future. I think we are all familiar with this image, hopefully not from our own experience, but only from that of our patients, but at some point it will hit us too. Either the knee hurts or some other joints hurt. If you then look at the image more closely, you'll sometimes find a clear change in the x-ray picture and when the surgeon actually cuts it open, he sees in part the typical image. The cartilage is gone. Osteoarthritis is as simple as that. No, not really. One sees this as the case because the objectives of therapy have to be adapted very individually to what the individual patient needs and to the severity of the osteoarthritis. The objectives are certainly very individual there in terms of pain, in terms of function, but also in terms of progression of the disease and how the patient can maintain mobility. The English medical system is ahead of us in some areas, behind in others. They are ahead of us in COVID vaccinations at the moment. They are also perhaps a little bit ahead of us on the subject at hand, because they have been practicing a holistic approach to the treatment of patients with osteoarthritis in their national guidelines for quite a long time, where the treatment is not just about the degenerative changes of the cartilage, but really the psychosocial component is very much in the foreground. The work environment is taken into account, the way you deal with pain, so on and so forth. They truly entertain a holistic approach to treating knee pain. This is an approach that we have primarily taken into account for the spine up to now, but it has not really reached the German general public in this way for many other joints. If you have a wide variety of options and a wide variety of causes, you also need a wide variety of treatment options, and accordingly, a large toolbox that provides diverse options for treatment and you should think about how to approach the right situation step by step with the right instrument. That is, a therapeutic stage scheme is certainly important in osteoarthritis treatment, and major surgery and joint replacement only appear at the very last stage. Before that, there are a wide range of other measures, starting with advising the patient to change his or her lifestyle, if necessary, and providing information on how to deal with the situation. Help for self-help simple, non-surgical measures, or even minor, simple, invasive measures. Today, however, we want to focus in particular on conservative therapy, and these are the points that I have listed again here. These are all wonderfully taken into account in the most different guidelines of the most diverse professional societies in Germany, but above all, also internationally. Before I present all the guidelines to you now, I have first compiled only those that have recently become of current interest. We see in Germany the last update has been set three years ago by the AWMF, the German Society of Orthopedics and Trauma Surgery. The Americans in the international medical community at large were a bit faster with updates issued in 2019 and 2020. I want to show you very briefly a little bit about the German guideline and the American rheumatism guideline, as well as the comparative look at the other different guidelines that are out there. This is the concept of drug therapy for gonarthrosis in Germany. It's relatively straightforward, not to say relatively simply structured and relatively banal, because it's exactly what I learned somewhere 30 years ago as a medical student. There's not too much one can do to treat osteoarthritis other than giving a little something for pain and giving a little something for inflammation. That is, the first stage is to offer topical NSAID, if it's not enough, then oral NSAID, and already in the case one learns that a large percentage of NSAIDs have many side effects. So you have to pay very good attention to whether the patient has gastrointestinal or cardiovascular problems, 
and make appropriate adjustments. If this is not enough, the recommended next level is to inject glucosamine, hyaluronic acid, or even corticoid steroids into the knee, and if these measures do not bring relief, a last therapeutic attempt is opioids over a short period of time in low dosage. If this fails, surgery remains a final option. So the options are still limited but relatively straightforward when you consider the scope of the German guideline. What the Germans do point out in the guideline, however, is the range of problems involved with using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You see here that for naproxen, ibuprofen, diclofenic, and also for the COX-2 inhibitors, you have to be careful, especially with regard to gastrointestinal or cardiovascular problems. You must adapt for renal insufficiency, and you also have to consider the effects on the lungs and so on. What are our friends in America doing? The American College of Rheumatology, along with the American Rheumatism League and the Arthritis Foundation, have issued guidelines that they keep updating. The last one was just two years ago. They now have structured the guideline to give strong recommendations or conditionally strong recommendations in the positive, but also in the negative, for different measures. And you see here that similar to us, these basic measures, exercise treatments, self-treatment training, weight loss, tai chi, and the like, are also recommended. For many of the other things, however, they are only conditional recommendations so far. Conditional means it is light green, whereas strong recommendations appear in dark green. In terms of medications, the ACR also recommends topical and oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and, if necessary, intra-articular steroids. But the ACR also has this red table with strong recommendations or conditional recommendations against such usage. Or rather where they say, we have no evidence, or have negative evidence. And accordingly, they don't even recommend many of these measures that are listed here because they just say that's not proven at the moment, or it's been proven that the measure has no positive effect. So it's quite interesting to look at this compilation as well. If you want to get a good overview of everything, I can recommend that you read a publication from JAMA, the American journal, that was published just four weeks ago. A nice interview by Mr. Katz on diagnosis and treatment of hip and knee osteoarthritis. He has summarized what's included in the most diverse international guidelines, both from the ACR, that is the Rheumatism League or the Rheumatism Society of America, the European Rheumatism Society, Euler, the American Orthopedic Society, the AAOS, but also the Worldwide Arthritis Society, ORC. Here you also see again in the upper part of the non-pharmacological treatments we have already mentioned, where there is relative consensus. Then, down in the drug area, there is also relative consensus really only for topical and oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. For many others, we see yellow dots, red dots, or orange dots. You are welcome to take a look at this overview at your leisure. I think it is quite interesting to compare your own therapy measures in this respect. In his summary, Mr. Katz writes in this review that there are basically five different pillars the non drug treatment, just with exercise treatments, patient information and weight loss, and if necessary, appropriate psychovegetative measures such as yoga and tai chi. The non or anti inflammatory treatment with non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, or COX 2 inhibitors, intra articular injection if necessary possibly additional drugs such as duloxetine and opioids only appear very briefly and really only in the penultimate stage before then recommending surgery. And here you have the compiled standardized mean difference, meaning what effect these individual measures really have on the sensation of pain expressed by the patient. And you actually have the greatest degree of intensity, the best efficiencies, in mind-body programs like yoga and tai chi, or exercise programs and weight loss. There is much less effect from the drug therapy or injections. This means that we should fundamentally consider how to proceed with osteoarthritis treatment. We are not the only ones doing it. There are many, many people in the world doing it for good reason, or have interest in a huge market that exists in this field. Currently, we have a heterogeneous etiology of osteoarthritis. Accordingly, 
there is a need for a multimodal therapeutic approach. There are no successful curative measures so far, only symptomatic drug therapy with limited efficacy, but a high degree of side effects and contraindication. Why is that? We should take another look at the pathophysiology, and it is not as I have shown in the first image that just the cartilage is a bit disquamated, but there is a massive inflammatory process that also takes place in the joint, which is shown quite well in this image, where you can see a bit of what is going on there in the inflammatory cascades, and activities which are mutually dependent and destroy the joint, and also trigger a lot of inflammatory processes in the whole body, but especially in this local area. Accordingly, this balance, which is actually there between anabolic and catabolic processes, is impaired and triggered by something that tips this scale to one side, and some of these mediators are then produced accordingly in excess and generate problems. However, this is one of the options to start therapeutically by saying, we either try to stimulate one side or to slow down the other side. This is the reason for the new therapeutic approaches, which Mr. Katz has also summarized very nicely in his article. The basic distinction is that you can think about trying to inhibit inflammation, trying to address pain primarily, trying to slow down or rebuild cartilage destruction, or you can even target the subchondral bone. And if you look at it now, of course, there are very, very many different ways to influence pain. Some are listed here, about the opioid receptor you can try to target, bradykinin you can try to block, NGF you can try to block, and so forth. Here are some things I have compiled for you as they are currently on the market. As you can see, there is a wide variety of areas in the development stage, in Phase 2 and Phase 3 trials, but not much progress has been made yet and not exactly with any major success to this day. One of the areas is the nerve growth factor. You can see in the third table from the top on the left, when the joint wear increases in animals, the cartilage wear has increased even more, making the joint increasingly unstable, so that the NGF area significantly grows larger. And there, of course, one can try to think of ways to slow down this NGF, that obviously needs to go through receptors. And as you already know, one could try to take an NGF antibody. This has also been done, and in various trials, it has been found that by blocking NGF, pain can be significantly reduced, function can be significantly improved, and therefore, a good step forward can be achieved for the time being. However, a rapid progression of osteoarthritis has been observed in some of the patients. The placebo progress group is marked with black, and some of the treatment groups are correspondently marked with red, yellow, or green. You can see that the endpoint knee, TEP, was achieved significantly earlier in many of these treated patients than in the placebo group. In other words, although pain and function were initially well addressed, patients later had to undergo surgery sooner because they had experienced a progression of their osteoarthritis. Another area that could be seen as a target is the inflammatory area. Exactly these cytokines that are secreted, the interleukins, the tumor necrosis factor, all these could be blocked and one could try to intervene somewhere in the cascade of inflammatory processes this way. This has also been done at a variety of levels with a number of different trials. In Mr. Katz's summary, it is quite nice that he says to date, meaning up to now, at this point in time. We haven't really found anything in any of the trials of these biologics that have tried to block interleukin or TNF. They really haven't proven to be a good success. However, one thing has actually been successful, but rather by chance. They took this canakinumab, which was actually intended for a completely different trial, namely a thrombosis trial, or antithrombosis trial, and looked again at all the patients in this area to find out when they received a hip or knee replacement. Surprisingly, they discovered that the patients who received this interleukin antibody for thrombosis reasons or antithrombosis reasons received the knee or hip TEP significantly later, 
This fact made everybody happy, since they saw it as a wonderful endpoint, but unfortunately not an endpoint that they had defined appropriately before the start of the trial. So you can't really say that this effect has been achieved through this drug. But it's an initial indication, and the area will certainly be looked into further. The third big area where you can go into osteoarthritis treatment is to use the disease-modifying drugs, where you can try to slow down the progression of the disease somewhere via one of the very many points mentioned here. Among other things, one can use some of these cartilage degradation inhibiting drugs, including some you are also familiar with, such as hyaluronic acid, which can be injected to possibly even rebuild the cartilage. But there are no really convincing results on this procedure so far, either. Mr. Katz writes candidly in his review that nothing was really found there either, at least nothing major enough to count as a big step forward. There are some promising areas that I've listed for you here, including about these aging cells that you can try to stop aging in order to possibly slow down the initiation of the cascade. But overall, there are still very many open questions and no breakthrough has been really achieved yet. There are alternatives or complementary measures that are used, some of which are also applied frequently, some of them costing plenty of money, including invasive actions, such as autologous cartilage transplantation or mesenchymal stem cell injection, or also this PRP, i.e. platelet-rich plasma, which you can infiltrate. There are individual trials about the method that have also shown good results, but so far, no really large, appropriately adequate clinical trial that can prove the efficacy with sufficient convincing data. So this also means a possibility, but so far, no real proof that it brings major relief. Another measure is to think about so-called enzyme therapy. Enzyme therapy is based on the fact that enzymes can be absorbed via the intestinal mucosa, which then bind to the molecule alpha-2 macroglobulin, thereby converting it into an active form. And these large proteins can then try to irreversibly bind the excess cytokines. This approach seems to be working out quite well. The second promising area is the field of immunomodulation. Here we assume a direct proteolytic activity and activation of macrophages and monocytes, a curbing or even stopping of leukocytosis in the inflammatory area, an activation of cytokine synthesis in the mononuclear cells, and even a splitting of the immune complexes, and thus a prevention of the complement activation and the initiation of these cascades that destroy the joint. So far, there have been relatively few clinical trials on this phenomenon. There have been a few small-scale trials conducted over the last few years, which have been summarized in a meta-analysis that Mr. Uberall has published. And there was just an attempt to make a meta-analysis from six trials that existed clinically in total and to see what one could get out of it. In the treatment of just over 750 patients, either Wobenzyme or diclofenic placebo, or the exact opposite, namely diclofenic and Wobenzyme placebo, were used for 3, 6, or 12 weeks, with the primary endpoint, Lacan index, and the secondary endpoint, rest and movement evoked pain. In addition, the safety and tolerability of the drug was considered, and then the results were considered. It turned out that they were quite interesting. First of all, these are the trials listed again, and you see these include some small trials with unfortunately also only quite short follow-up data, namely 3 to 6 weeks but also a larger trial by Mr. Bolton over 12 weeks with an adequate number of patients that yielded very interesting results. Namely, the primary endpoint that was defined, the Lacan Algo Functional Index, achieved equal effects in both treatment groups for the diclofenic group and the enzyme group. In other words, no significant difference between the two therapy groups. This is shown again here in the image sequence. You see the baseline situation with the enzymes and the diclofenic at about the same level, and also the effect group thereafter. The secondary endpoint, the pain at rest, and also the movement evoked pain. Also, you always see NS in the right column, meaning non-significant differences between the two groups. This can be illustrated much better, and as a surgeon, I am always the kind of person who wants to see something clearly. And you see here the differences between the diclofenic versus the enzyme group 
and there are no significant differences in terms of pain at rest and pain in motion. However, there were significant differences in terms of side effects. The adverse event rate for diclofenac was much higher than for the enzyme therapy for both gastrointestinal and cardiovascular histories, and laboratory changes were also much more frequent with diclofenac than with enzyme therapy. That is, in summary, he consistently wrote that there was significant equivalent improvement in knee joint function and pain in these patients regardless of whether they received diclofenac or Wobenzyme. Thus, one can assume comparability of the clinical efficacy of these two drugs. However, the adverse event occurrence was significantly lower in the Wobenzyme group than in the diclofenac group. Also, there was clearly significant increase in liver values in the diclo group versus the enzyme group, and clearly significant change in blood count compared to the diclo group. There are certainly restrictions to be made here. There have been no placebo comparisons so far, and there is no long-term follow-up. The EMA nowadays expects 12 weeks follow-up for such measures. Therefore, the value of this trial cannot be fully assessed. But therefore, a new randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial is planned, where exactly this group of patients is to be examined using the measures of Wobenzyme therapy versus placebo, with a whole host of interesting markers too, both cartilage markers and inflammation markers, as well as corresponding clinical markers. So it will certainly be extremely interesting to see what comes out of it shortly. At the moment, however, we also have to say that patients need a multimodal therapeutic approach. This is the scheme like the one which the English give to their colleagues. Different pieces of the puzzle have to fit together, hopefully the right ones for the individual patient. And finally in this picture, I can only say that osteoarthritis, as we have seen, is a very heterogeneous clinical picture with very different triggers, but also very different clinical courses. The symptoms should be treated, not the x-ray image. We do not have curative approaches to date. Symptomatic therapy is essentially aimed at reducing pain and inflammation and possibly progression of the disease. The guidelines, whether German or international, recommend a multimodal approach, with the international guidelines emphasizing a far more multimodal treatment to date than the German ones. Maybe we can learn a bit more there. Pharmacological therapy options are manageable so far, but have significant side effects and contraindications, so one can hope for promising things from new therapeutic approaches, but substantial clinical testing is yet to come. And the bottom line is that patient management is critical. Because the expectations should be realistic, not everyone who comes in with knee pain on the left side will regain the same mobility as on the right side as a result of knee pain treatment. Thank you very much. Professor Dreinhofer, thank you very much for your informative presentation. It also shows the dilemma that we pain therapists have, that we are actually not allowed to treat pain patients who come in already adjusted with NSAIDs because they already have been receiving them for months or even years and have an ulcer. On the other hand, we are only supposed to treat patients with opioids in the short term, but the patient is still in pain and is not supposed to undergo surgery. That's a real dilemma, and of course the anti-inflammatory effect, if we had something there, that would help the patient. That would be something innovative again, which would also really benefit patients and make it easier for us to treat effectively. I have a couple of questions here, but we only have just a little bit of time left. We've gotten two minutes on top of that. A question from the audience. X-ray stimulation irradiation. Specific anti-inflammatory diet. Can you say something about this? Interestingly enough, these are all things that are used relatively frequently, especially in German-speaking countries. There is very little evidence for it, and the fact that, especially now in the Anglo-American sphere, such treatments as these are not even mentioned because they are, I would say, scientifically quite untested. Okay, does platelet-rich plasma play a role? I touched on this briefly. This PRP therapy can potentially play a good role. It's something that has become more and more important over the last decade. There are some good clinical trials with manageable patient numbers on this topic. There are a few good placebo-controlled trials, but none of them blinded. Is the situation probably also similar with leech therapy? Correct. 
So we've now answered almost all questions, but one question from the audience is still left concerning Wobenzyme. In the trial, what was the dosage and duration of the therapy with Wobenzyme? Three times two tablets. Three times for how long? Depending on how those trials were set up, so partly for three weeks, partly for six weeks. In the trial by Mr. Bolton, the duration was over 12 weeks. And one last question, are you familiar with MBST core spin therapy? Yes, I know about it, and I can say the same as I mentioned earlier. You notice when you talk about multimodal approaches, you can also say about multimodal treatment that I use a great many therapeutic measures for which there is little evidence. This is still quite possible in the German-speaking area, and one can certainly offer such things if one has gathered good personal experience and describes the measures to the patient with the relativity of evidence. In other health systems that are more evidence-based, something like this tends not to be offered. Okay, a nice closing word. Thank you for your very fine presentation, and also thanks to the audience for the questions. If any further questions have arisen in the meantime, you can still ask them now. Professor Dreinhofer has told me he will answer those as well. Thank you very much for listening, and I wish you all the best for the rest of the Congress. Greetings to Berlin, and I almost said, have a good trip home. Many thanks, Mr. Sherman. Goodbye, everyone.